Hello, you're watching HD Live. I'm Mabel Jong. States across the country are seeking more resources to ramp up the massive vaccine distribution effort that would help end the pandemic. According to the CDC tracker, the United States is well short of the federal goal to vaccinate 20 million people by January 1. Why so behind and what are the implications of the slow rollout? Here to address that and other crucial COVID-19 vaccine concerns is Dr. Paul Offit, director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and one of the physicians on the FDA panel to approve these vaccines. Dr. Offit, nice to see you. Thank you. Our logistical challenges, both on the local and federal level, mostly to blame for the slow rollout. Yeah, well, first of all, this is hard to do. I mean, it was hard enough to, to make a vaccine. Uh, you know, we only had this virus in hand in January of 2020. We knew the sequence. And then within 11 months, we had already done two large clinical trials proving the vaccine worked, proving it was effective in 44,000, 30,000 people. That is an amazing accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But that's just step one. And, and the reason we accomplished it is we, because we gave money to do it. We, we put forward, this country put forward $24 billion to get us to, to have a vaccine in hand. But now comes the hard part, which is, as they say, the old saying is the hardest part of making a vaccine is making the vaccine, meaning mass producing it. That's number one. It's not so easy to do to mass produce this. It is a novel technology. And that lipid nanoparticle, that sort of complex lipid delivery system in which the messenger RNA sits, is not easily scaled up. And so that's that's one of the problems. Secondly, once you've scaled it up, then you have to put in place a distribution system, which we don't currently have in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to have to be a mass distribution system, you know, where you use, you know, large auditoriums and stadiums and churches and synagogues to mass vaccinate people. This can't be done the way we normally do vaccine. This can't be done the way we normally do flu vaccine every year. We have, right. to have these mass distribution centers, and that also is going to re require a lot of money. And, and today we haven't really put that that part up uh, in, into that uh, so that we, we have something that's workable right now. Right. Well, as you mentioned, it's incredibly impressive, really shocking that a vaccine is available available so soon after the discovery of that new virus. But and the vaccine is a product of messenger RNA technology, about 20 years old. Yet this is the very first time that it will be used in people in a vaccination program. So is it understandable that people are concerned, that perhaps they're scared, that we don't know enough about what's going into our bodies and what could happen down the road? No, sure. I mean, it's a novel technology. There's no commercial experience with a messenger RNA vaccine. That said, we've just done two large clinical trials. We did a trial of 44,000 people in the Pfizer vaccine, 30,000 in the Moderna vaccine. The size of that trial is the size of any typical pediatric vaccine. So, so that's not that's not different. You know now that you can say with confidence it's roughly 95% effective in, in, in people, including those over 65 years of age, including those with comorbidities. And you know that it's safe in terms of, of looking two months after or any dose, uh, you know, that, that you can say it's safe in tens of thousands of people, which means that it doesn't have a relatively uncommon severe side effect. Right. You haven't proven that it doesn't have a rare serious side effect, but that's true of any medical product. And then you, you don't know how long efficacy is going to last. But, you know, with 95 percent efficacy after two or three months, you can feel pretty comfortable that this is going to be highly effective for a while. And you don't have the time to do a two or three or four year study to see how long it lasts when 350,000 people have died this year. So I think we've mitigated a lot of the risk by doing these two large trials. And, and people should be, feel comfortable with this. I mean, I got my first dose of vaccine. I can't wait to get my second dose of vaccine yeah. so that I can be protected. Uh, yet are there people, certain people with uh, pre-existing conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, maybe with allergies, whom you would not recommend getting a vac uh, vaccinated? So again, people who, who are at risk of this of the severe disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 um, are included in these trials. People with diabetes, people with obesity, people with chronic lung disease, people with chronic heart disease, they're in these trials just to make sure that the vaccine is safe and effective in them also. And it is. I think the only people who really can't get this vaccine are those who have ever had a serious allergic reaction to any component of this kind of vaccine. That's it. I mean, even people who've had severe allergic reactions otherwise, like to, to food items like peanuts or allergies, they can get this vaccine. They just have to wait for 30 minutes in the office or in wherever the place that they're getting it to make sure they don't have a severe allergic reaction. Okay. And what would be considered typical side effects? Right. So, so this, this vaccine does have a, a, a um, difficult side effect profile, if you will. So you can get fatigue, headache, muscle ache, 
low-grade fever, joint pain, um, and, and many as 50% of people who get this vaccine. It happens less frequently in people who are over 65. It happens more frequently after the second dose and the first dose. I mean, after I got the first dose, I, on day two, I had pretty significant fatigue and, and a low-grade fever, but that is a small price to pay. I mean, all that is is your immune system working. When your immune system sort of gears up to recognize, in this case, this SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is what the messenger RNA is making, um, you know, you you it makes it has certain proteins of the immune system called cytokines, which have a side effect. This is that side effect. I, we should have a different name for it. I wish the immune system had a better better public relations team because this is just your immune system working for it. Right. Okay. Now, can you be vaccinated and still spread the virus to others? Right, so we don't know that yet. The, the two trials that were done by Pfizer and Moderna were trials to see whether or not the vaccine prevented disease, mild, moderate, or severe disease. It didn't prove whether it could prevent infection, let's say, without symptoms where you could still be contagious. Um, those studies are presumably going to be done early next year. So I, I do think people who get the vaccine um, should still consider it possible that if they are exposed to the virus, that they could uh, asymptomatically transmit it. I, I don't. I think that that even though um, that you may be asymptomatically infected, my suspicion is is that even though you may shed virus, it would be a much lower quantity of virus because you'd been vaccinated. So you would be less contagious than had you not been vaccinated. But again, those studies need to be done. Okay. Now you've had a lot of experience in the development of vaccines. You co-developed the rotavirus vaccine, which took about 25 years, by the way. So going up against vaccine hesitancy and aggressive anti-vaxxers is nothing new to you. What kind of messaging works when trying to convince skeptics that vaccines are worth getting, especially this new one? Right. So I think you can you can divide sort of an anti-vaccine sentiment, if you will, into two categories. One is a perfectly understandable category, what I would call the vaccine skeptic, someone who is concerned about this vaccine. I mean, you, you know, it, 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 uh, it hasn't been tested for very long. It's been tested now in a few million people, but not tens of millions of people. How do I know it's safe? How do I know it's effective in the long term? That's fair. I think that's a fair question. You should be skeptical of anything you put in your body. I would argue everybody who sits around that table at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting is a skeptic. I mean, show us the data. But I think now you have data in hand that should should make you feel comfortable. So I think that in terms of the skeptic, I think the skeptic can be convinced with data that are presented in a compelling, passionate, and compassionate way. The second group I would call the vaccine cynic. These are people who believe that there's a big conspiracy out there, that the pharmaceutical companies control the government, the pharmaceutical companies control the medical establishment. They're not going to believe anything you say. As uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, if you've reached a conclusion that is not based on logic or reason, then logic or reason isn't going to talk you out of it. So, I, so don't even try. Um, that, that, fortunately, is a very small percentage of people. Okay. Uh, you've said in the past, actually recently, uh, that normalcy could return in the fall of 2021. Are you revising your timeline at all since the vaccine rollout is so slow? Right. I'm, I, well, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan, so I should sort of offer that as a caveat that I'm ridiculously optimistic. But I, I do think that um, if we can get on track in the way that the Biden uh, administration to be is, has said, which is let's give a million doses a day. I think if we can do that or get a million people vaccinated today, um, I, I think then that by summer, late summer, we, we should be able to have enough people vaccinated that we are able to have a normal life again. And remember, although we never talk about this, uh, 20 million people have been infected or, or reported to have been infected, which is to say 20 million people in the United States have been tested and found to have been infected. Uh, many people have asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease that never got tested. So if you look at antibody studies, which is a much better marker for how many people have really been infected with this virus, that 20 million figure is probably off by a factor of three. It's probably more like 60 million people in the United States have been infected. That's about 20 percent of, of the U.S. population who, when they're exposed to this virus, again, are very unlikely to get sick. I mean, certainly not really sick. So, so that is, is, is it, when people, we talk about immunizing 70 or 80 or 90% of the U.S. population, there's 20% of this population that's already immune. So it's probably, we probably don't need to, to vaccinate, you know, um, as, as the largest, the larger percentage that we're thinking of. I think if we can get to 70% vaccination rates, we can dramatically slow the spread of this virus. Hopefully we can get there by late summer. And then what will that look like? Are we still going to be walking around wearing the masks? And when will we know when the vaccinations are working? 
Well, well, I think we'll know the vaccinations are working when you look at the number of cases and, and hospitalizations and deaths every year. I mean, what should happen, I'm sorry, every every uh, week, you should start to see a gradual diminution in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. That's way you'll, the way you'll know that, that the vaccine is working. And then it's a matter of sort of what we can live with. You know, we... Every year in this country, we suffer influenza. This past year, we had 20,000 influenza deaths and about uh, about 400,000 hospitalizations. The year before that, we had 700,000 influenza hospitalizations and 60,000 deaths. If we wore masks and social distance every winter, we could dramatically reduce those numbers, but we don't. We, we live with that. Um, and I think it may come down to that with this. When do we get to the point where we say, you know, we can live with this level of disease? We'll mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a final word on kids. Uh, we're starting to see some testing uh, with kids. When will we have the data to know that it will be safe for them? Right. So, so children were really not part of these trials. Uh, the Pfizer went down to 16 years of age, Moderna 18 years of age. So we don't really have data in children. And the main reason being that if you look at people less than 21 years of age in the United States comprise 26 percent of the U.S. population, but only 0.08 percent of the deaths. So they're, they're not a high priority group, as distinct from nursing homes, for example, where 40 percent of the deaths of, 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 from this virus have occurred. Um, the studies are already starting, um, hopefully in children. Hopefully we'll have data, um, hopefully by the time the children go back to school next year, because children do need to be vaccinated. They need to be vaccinated because they too can suffer and be hospitalized and die from this. I mean, I was on service at Children's Hospital Philadelphia last week. We have children in our hospital who have this infection. And mm -hmm. uh, any time you can prevent a child from suffering or being hospitalized or dying, and you can do that safely, then we should do it. And I think we can do that with this vaccine. We just need to, to test it first. You can't give this vaccine to children just based on studies in adults, because you have to show that in children, the vaccine is also safe and effective first. All right, Dr. Paul Offit, thank you so much, Dr. Paul Offit of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an advisor to the FDA. Thank you. And thank you for watching HD Live. I'm Mabel Jong.